Donna are going to come up and say a couple words about opportunities in IP, and then we'll jump right into the panel. I just wanted to say briefly, uh, my name is Keith Hand. I, I teach Introduction to Chinese Law here. Uh, and I'm, I'm working uh, with our faculty and administration to build uh, an East Asian law program at Hastings. And we are sending more and more students out to East Asia uh, for summer internships uh, and even uh, for permanent jobs. And we've seen a lot of demand in the IP area. Uh, we have uh, sort of built both formal and in informal relationships with a number of law firms both foreign firms and domestic uh, Chinese firms. Uh, and they're very interested in students with IP expertise. So it's great to see uh, such a large uh, turnout. And I'm sure we'll get some fantastic advice about uh, strategies uh, you might think about as you're, you're considering your career path and possibly going out to Asia. And I want you to know that we uh, have resources here. Uh, so uh, please you know, get in touch with the Career Center or, or come by and see me. Uh, if you're interested in these types of possibilities. Um, uh, there are quite a few of them. Hi, my name is Dana Belgeman, and I teach a course in international and comparative IP in the spring semester. Uh, this year, it will have an emphasis on China, and in particular of interest, that's what I'm trying to mention to you, is we will have a visiting scholar from Jiaotong University in Shanghai. His name is Wang Yong, and uh, his expertise is copyright law, so he will teach much of, if not all, of the copyright portion of the IP, uh, of the comparative and international IP course, and possibly other courses. And so I think this is a good opportunity to be exposed directly to a professor who's coming from China, from Shanghai, and form a relationship and possibly see uh, you know, what, how you can develop this further academically or professionally. So uh, number one, I encourage you to take the course. Number two, um, I, I encourage you, even if you don't take the course, please uh, connect with Professor Wan Yong because uh, it might, might help you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm Anna Rook from the Career Office, and as you can tell, this has really been a big group effort putting this together. So I really want to acknowledge and thank Professor Hand and Donna Belderman, as well as Chris Manning, who's not here, but will be, I think, stopping in a little bit later. Um, and I also want to thank all the student orgs who really, um, really made this happen, especially the Hastings China um, Law and Culture Society, and APALSA, and the Hastings IP Association, and VALS, and CALSA, and SALSA. Um, and thank you, finally, to our speakers, and welcome. We have Janet Zhao, who's a partner at Morrison Forster in the Life Sciences Group in Palo Alto, and she represents clients in the biotech and pharmaceutical industries in their worldwide patent procurement, patent portfolio management, and strategic planning, and she's an expert in IP issues that are unique to China. And Song Zhu is a partner at Squire Sanders, where he represents clients in IP litigation, procurement, opinion, and due diligence in the US and worldwide. And he, too, is an expert in IP protection in the US and China. So please join me in welcoming our speakers. <laughs> and I should say, Kathy is um, from HCLCS is moderating, so thank you. I'm Kathy. I'm the co-president of Hastings Chinese Law and Culture Society, and so I just wanted to talk to thank our speakers again. And so I want to ask you first about some of to give an introduction to the students about your background and how your practice intersects with China, or not China, Asia in general. Uh, hi, I'm Janet Xiao. Um, I've from Morrison Foster. I grew up in China, um, and I was educated there um, under the communism. And then I came to the United States for a PhD in biochemistry. Um, I got my education in UCLA. And um, I was on the career path to become a professor in biochemistry. And I met somebody who's really illuminating, and actually in some similar setting here, like a career discussion. Um, he's now the general counsel of Genentech, Sean Johnson, mm -hmm. Johnson. And he kind of inspired me to become a pattern trainer. So I went to law school after I got my PhD, which is in Berkeley. And, um, and when I was in law school, I already knew pattern law was what I was going to do. 
I joined Morris and Forster, and our practice to have them all. What I do is, more, my clients are mainly in the life science sector, biotechnology, pharmaceutical. So I help them devise their patent portfolio, so they have to help them protect their intellectual property. Um, and um, I also work, work with startups to, uh, to build a strong IP position in that regard. So I'm a patent attorney. Um, but aside from that, part of my passion is, of course, China. Because I came from China, I have deep roots in China. I'm also the president of Chinese American Biopharmaceutical Society. It's a nonprofit organization with about 2,000 members. So I have been deeply involved in this society, too, uh, both serving as a bridge between U.S. and China, uh, both as in, in my uh, president capacity and also in my legal capacity. So in the recent years, we have seen a significant increase in interest between U.S. and China collaboration. And I have been shifting some of my practice focus to facilitate U.S.-China collaboration in terms of technology transfer, um, IP procurement, and um, those sort of things. And that's really kind of gratifying because it helps me to, to leverage my background, science, China, and law. And that's pretty much where I am right now. Um, I'm originally from China as well. I uh, came to the U.S. for graduate school. Um, and unfortunately, I also have a PhD. It's, um, it's not a requirement for IP. <laughs> probably more of a hindrance uh, than anything else. Um, what I do is uh, somewhat different from what Janet does. Uh, I kind of litigate um, IP cases in the U.S. for uh, Chinese companies. And also, I litigate IP cases in China. Um, I mean, litigate cases in the U.S. for Chinese companies and litigate uh, cases, IP cases, in China for foreign companies, mostly uh, U.S. companies. So I have a slightly different perspective than uh, Jeff. Uh, I spent, uh, last year I spent about uh, four and a half months of my time in China. And this year I only spent about a month in China, maybe a month and a half. And next year I'm probably going to spend at least nine months. Uh, a disclaimer, I um, partner as far as senders, but I have uh, uh, tendered my resignation, so I'm leaving as far as senders to go to another firm called Hogan Novels. It has a significant uh, presence in China, uh, especially in, in the area of IP litigation. So that's uh, kind of focus of my head as well. Uh, so I, just a short uh, introduction myself, and I'd be very happy to answer any questions. Um, thank you. And can you describe? Uh, I think both of you guys touched about touched upon that a little bit. But can you describe the kind of work that you do in China? Um, is it mainly litigation based or transactional? Um, so I'm a patent attorney, and um, I don't litigate cases. Um, my daily life is really what a typical patent attorney does draft and patent application, work with inventors, and develop patent strategies. For China, it's a little different, because they also ask us to draft applications, but they're not so sophisticated. There's much less discussion. Even though we try to build in our strategic strengths there, it's less appreciation for that. There is a bigger transactional component, so I'm involved in a U.S.-China collaboration. And the, the Chinese company, now it's an emerging trend. Chinese company having a lot of money looking for technology <laughs> in the US. So we do a lot of those cross-border transactions. And a lot of new issues come up, which I don't typically see as a patent attorney. So for example, tax issues. If you buy this company, what kind of transaction would be the best for tax purposes? Or cross-border licensing issues. If you import some technology to, the China, to China, is there any regulatory issue that you will face in the U.S.? Or even bigger problem is what kind of regulation Chinese government will face, and vice versa. So those, those kind of things. And in addition to that, issues unique to the Chinese IP system, because as you know, patent system is very juris jurisdictional. 
So even though we're trying to harmonize, that's still the big way to go. So there are a lot of issues unique to Chinese pattern law you need to keep in mind, too. Um, and I can give some examples if you guys are interested in listening. And, and that is more interesting than recently that is the U.S. pattern law reform. That is people are talking about the harmonization. U.S. is shifting to the first part of the system. It's much more complicated than that. So we're always operating on the two different law, and that makes my life very challenging. <laughs> Um, as I mentioned earlier, I mostly uh, do litigation. I think litigation is uh, very interesting, especially what I do. Um, for Chinese companies who are litigated in the U.S., most of the time, their defendants are being sued by U.S. companies, and they have to make a decision as to whether to respond to the lawsuit. Um, and if, respond, if you don't respond, there are consequences, the default judgments, the enforcement of the judgment in the U.S., and, have impact on your business in the future. So quite often, the Chinese companies are not as sophisticated. You know, they have not never involved in a lawsuit, never involved in a lawsuit in a foreign country. So they have a lot of questions about litigation in the U.S. And the first, the, probably the most important question for them is whether, whether to respond. And sometimes uh, there are alleged damages in the billions of dollars. And there's, I don't know if you've heard of the drywall case hundreds of billions of dollars of alleged damages. And whether it's worthwhile to respond to this kind of lawsuit. If you do decide to respond, then the procedures in the U.S. are very different uh, from the procedures in China. Not only for a litigant company, but for even Chinese lawyers. It's difficult to understand. And there are you know, ethical obligations and whether to turn over <coughs> you know, documents, the discovery process, and, and so forth. So it's it's for those who understand the Chinese legal system and the, understand the Chinese culture, and also U.S. attorney. I think you can play a very important role. You can explain to the Chinese the importance of uh, respond honestly, truthfully to discovery requests. Explain the procedure in the United States, and these are you know there's a huge demand for people who can. Uh, increasingly, there are litigation cases involving Chinese companies. There's anti-dumping, there's uh, you know, IP, there are recently there are uh, securities class action lawsuits for Chinese companies that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange. So every few years you have different waves of litigation. So for those of you who are interested in doing that kind of work, I would uh, suggest that you not only um, you know, learn the U.S. system, but learn the Chinese system as well. If you speak Chinese, that, that would be very helpful. Uh, it's, it's not required, but it would be very helpful. And this is really a growing area. And if you have expertise in this area, I think it would be in high demand. I was just talking to... Uh, now, let me go into the second aspect of my practice. The other aspect is uh, representing U.S. companies in in China. And the Chinese legal system is very different. It's a civil law system and has um, quote unquote Chinese characters. <laughs> so for US lawyers, uh, it's very difficult to understand as well. I we, uh, I'm, we are litigating a huge case in China for a US company. The US company lost about $11 million a year uh, right now because of the infringing activities of uh, one particular Chinese company. Uh, formed by the former general partner of, of my client. <laughs> so uh, this is a huge case, and the in-house lawyer was very frustrated by the lack of discovery in China, uh, various um, procedures in China that are not that transparent. You know, there are ex party communications uh, with the judges, and that's okay, uh, even required. So there are a lot of uncertainty, possible government interference, and so forth. So if someone who understands the Chinese system can explain to the U.S. lawyer what is happening, how to respond to, in the request of judges. And these people with that kind of experience and expertise in high demand as well. Uh, one of the reasons I'm actually going to open levels is because um, the, the IP cases in China involving foreign companies are increasing like 70 60, 70% a year. Uh, 
probably two, three years ago. I don't have the current numbers. They haven't come out yet. And the China offices or foreign offerings are building this capability to, make, to meet the demand. So the IP litigation partners are hired everywhere. The, the firms that didn't have that capability want to hire partners that are doing this kind of work. And the firm lost partners and try and scramble to find new partners. So there's a really a huge demand uh, for people with that kind of experience and expertise. So if you're interested in that, um, it's hard to predict what's going to happen two or three years from now, but I suspect there will, you know, the demand for that kind of expertise will continue. So if you're interested in that area, um, I would suggest that you start, start building uh, you know, your experience, expertise, and uh, pay attention to you know, what's the development of IP law in China. Um, I, I think uh, um, it will help you uh, with your career path if that's what you're interested in. So it seems like there is a growing demand for jobs related to Asia, but um, there are kind of two categories of jobs, and so are job prospects better to look for a U.S.-based job here um, with an Asia component or a job in Asia? So which one is more, rec which one would you more recommend at this point? I have actually recently just had this exact discussion with one of our summer associates. Um, he graduated from, I think, from uh, Boston. He will be graduated from Boston University, and we really like him. And he was facing exactly this kind of situation. So he ultimately he wants to be in China, but the question: Should he go in now, or should he go in later? So, and so, and let me share with you my perspective, and that's what I discussed with him. He's still considering what to do now. <laughs> so I think those are totally different paths. They probably eventually, if you want to be somebody who specializes in this, you want to leverage your U.S. education and you also want to leverage your knowledge about China. There are different ways to do that. One path is like what I'm doing. I'm far away from there. But to get the sort of training in the U.S., so to become an expert in U.S. law, and then at the same time you get, you educate yourself about Chinese law, so you are kind of familiar with it, but you get very solid training in the U.S. Then you go to China and you serve them. So that's a career path that you would be presenting yourself as a U.S. expert, but then you're familiar with the Chinese law. Your client base may be different. The second career path would be just to go to China right now. And there are reasons why you want to do that, because the, the legal system in China is different. It's not like what we're used to doing case law study, summarize, doing legal research. In China, the lawyer's role, and it, it may be different for litigators, I'm talking about business lawyers, um, and like patent attorneys. It's multifaceted. You have to know a lot of things, especially because like in a lot of Chinese institutions, they don't have many lawyers. They come to you for all kinds of issues, employment issues, tax issues, corporate issues. They want to know what kind of business model they want to do when they are doing a deal for them. And they all want, also want to know how strong IP is. So you want to know what kind of issues you want to be very knowledgeable. Not, you don't have to be expert in anything but you have to know everything so you can point them to those different directions and you can spot issues. And that's the kind of IT, uh, this kind of business attorneys I see that are successful in China when they start as somebody in China on the ground. So they know the rules, they know the ground rules, they know how the government plays, and when you are facing some kind of statue in China, which usually is ambiguous, you know who to call. <laughs> and usually it's a phone call that gives you the clarity. That those, that's a totally different career path. Yeah, I, I agree with Janet. I think to be uh, attorney, you have to have a solid base. Uh, you have to have the training, not only in terms of law, your knowledge of law, but also how to deal with, uh, how to work with clients, how, you know, the, the basic uh, training as attorney, practicing attorney, I think that's very different from what you learn in law school. So have a solid base of serving well, uh, regardless of what you do. Uh, you know, how to deal with partners and so forth. And that's very basic. You cannot be a good lawyer if you don't have a solid base, you know, regardless of how smart you are. Uh, because the practice, you know, law, the practice of law is very different from what you learn in law school. Uh, so this kind of training 
uh, you can only it can only be provided by um, law firms and working with partners, you know, for years and years. Um, I also agree with Janet that you know if you go to China immediately after law school, um, you kind of pigeonhole yourself. Uh, you know, you, it would be very difficult if you want to come back to the U.S. Uh, because uh, even though you're trained as a U.S. lawyer, you don't have the experience. You know, you're third or fourth or fifth year associate and never practice in the U.S. Law firms tend not to hire you. Um, they want you essentially to come to the U.S. and have to do U.S. work. So if you go to China, you essentially probably, as, as just out of law school, you probably have to stay in China for a long time. Um, even if you say, that's fine, I want to pigeonhole myself, you know, that's what I want to do. Practically speaking, it's still very difficult to do. For instance, if you come to me and say, oh, I want to work in your Shanghai office, my question is, what can you do from me? Do you, do you speak Chinese? Can you write in Chinese? In China, as a partner, you can get away with not being able to speak and write Chinese. But as an associate, you have to do that work. You cannot supervise other people. Um, so you have to be able to write and, and speak and understand Chinese law if you don't have these basic skills, which is very difficult to do. Maybe I could have gone back to China after law school, um, but if, if you didn't grow up in China, didn't speak the language, you know, you don't, you don't speak the language really well, I think that's something that's very difficult. So for, for also reasons not want to pigeonhole yourself, and also for practical reasons, I think going to China immediately is uh, very difficult to do. Okay, so for those of us who didn't um, necessarily grow up in China, so we're not completely familiar with Chinese laws, um, so how can a student prepare themselves to market themselves later on in their career as someone who wants to work in China um, by telling them, by showing that they're familiar with culture, laws, and um, I just heard that you guys are offering a lot of fantastic IP courses, like international law in China. Law, that's fantastic opportunities for, for students to get exposure to Chinese law. And also get involved in um, communities like the community I was involved in. We have a lot of non-Chinese speaking people who serve as volunteers for us, and we welcome everybody to be volunteers. And that, that helps you to get to know the industry. You don't necessarily have to know the language, but you know the situation, you know what kind of issues people are facing. That's very, very helpful. And we had a lot of um, volunteers who kind of thrived from this organization because they, kind of, they, heard, they hear about the kind of issues, and then when they go out, they just transfer what they heard to somebody who wants to hear. The question is, uh, uh, if you want to work in China, what you should do? Yeah, to, to get familiar with the laws right. and culture. Well, I think you know, uh, the way I did it, I mean, it's not the best way, but I think it's probably the most common way to do it is uh, after you graduate law school, you know, work at a law firm, um, doing essentially U.S. work. I mean, my first eight seven, eight years as an attorney, essentially doing 100% U.S. work. Um, and if you're interested in China, you can seek out partners who have Chinese clients and opportunity to work with Chinese clients. In that process, you will learn about China and Chinese law, how to work with Chinese uh, clients and their concerns. And the culture aspect, I think, is just as important as you know, your skill as, uh, skills as lawyers. And quite often now, because uh, almost all big U.S. law firms have a presence in China, you can request a transfer, spend a year or two years in China if there's a need. I think that's probably the best way to go about um, if you're interested in going to China. And that's, in most cases, how U.S. lawyers end up in China. Um, seeing how uh, law in China is still developing, then do you find yourself learning on the job a lot and having to seek out answers on your own and being more creative, that kind of thing? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, 
true to every question that you have. <laughs> yes to every question that you ask. Uh, yes, I, I didn't, you know, I, I'm a U.S. lawyer, I went to U.S. law school, I, I didn't have any training um, in Chinese law, so all that training is entirely on my own. I actually spent two, three years preparing to uh, take the Chinese bar. Uh, I didn't do it um, for various reasons. My firm uh, really discouraged me from doing it, spending time on that. Uh, but in that process, I learned a lot. I, I was very close to taking the Chinese bar, but I learned a lot. And that was entirely on my own time. Um, so if you're interested in learning about Chinese law and eventually working in China uh, or representing U.S. companies uh, in connection with China, giving them advice on Chinese law, you have to do it essentially on your own. Um, you know, if you read Chinese, it helps. If you don't, uh, that, <coughs> That's okay, because one of my partners, now he uh, left uh, my firm, is at uh, Shepard Mullen. He's probably one of the foremost um, uh, scholar on uh, Chinese law. Uh, he doesn't speak any Chinese. He writes a book, um, it's called China Law Desk Book, I think, for the American Bar Association. You can get a copy. His name is uh, James uh, Zimmerman. Uh, he's Two terms, Chairman of American Chamber of Commerce in China, worked in China for many years. And U.S. Law, uh, US companies really seek out, seek him out uh, when they go to China. And he doesn't speak, well, as far as I know, he doesn't speak any <laughs> Chinese. Uh, so you see, you can succeed in China even without speaking Chinese. So, but he, I'm sure he put in a lot of his own time to learn Chinese law and to write that. So that's something that you have, you have to kind of really devote yourself if you decide uh, to do that. Um, I can only speak from the patent law perspective because that's what I practice mostly. Um, and uh, I actually, I don't, I only practice U.S. law, but I oversee a global patent portfolio for my clients. So I'm constantly learning not just Chinese law, but Indian law, like Malaysian law. Definitely, you need to learn those. This, um, the thing with China is that you can't just learn on paper, and there is no clear answer at any time. Things can evolve also, and you can't rely on case law. So um, let me give you an example. We are trying to protect somebody's drug by the way you are giving it to this person. Like you, you give it twice a day instead of once a day. And that is very, very, um, there's a big advance of the um, in this field, like how you are administering. And it's in line with personalized medicine, which is a very hot area now, like how you are giving it to this patient. Um, and there are judges in, in the Beijing court, which is one of the leading Beijing intermediate court, leading IP court there, said that two years ago that you should be able to allow those kind of protection. Because if you don't allow people to get patent on there, how can we foster innovation? That's against the national policy. But the fact is, after two years from that decision, you, the patent office just uniformly reject those kind of claims. They don't give it. Um, and we try to rely on this case, try to argue that that's against public policy. <laughs> Nobody gives it um, any second look at it. The reason is because there is a nobody wants to make a change. There's a uniform understanding among the examiners that, um, that those kind of claims are not allowable. So if you take the liberty to allow the case, you may be in trouble. <laughs> so that's the kind of situation that we face in China. Like it's not necessarily black and white, and it's evolving. And it takes a, lot, a long time to, for the Chinese law to evolve. Now if I may kind of interject a little bit. I think it's quite often when uh, Americans, when they go to China, they're quite frustrated by this and that. Uh, and I can tell you, when the Chinese come here, they have a uh, very similar experience. So it goes both ways. And I think in order to work with uh, foreign clients and foreign companies, you have to keep an open mind and try to understand where they come from and their perspective. I think that's critical in order to be effective. Uh, you have to understand their position before you can explain what your position is. And I think keeping an open mind and, uh, is, is very important. 
Um, there seems to be a perception among U.S. companies and maybe even European companies that uh, protecting intellectual property in China is particularly difficult. So do you have any insights about that or um, and about any trends that are happening in China? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not the person, but I, I can give you my uh, thoughts on that. Um, you know, there, again, I think it's very important to keep an open mind here. Um, you know, we, uh, Professor Han, we hosted uh, the Chief Justice of uh, Chinese Supreme Court's I teach him right here. And, and I arranged for him to give a speech at uh, Stanford, Stanford Law School. It's, he's, he's actually, and his predecessor as well, is quite frustrated with, um, to some degree, perceived um, inadequacies in China in terms of IP protection. Uh, I think it's, it's, um, it's true there, you know, you see uh, infringing activities everywhere. You can buy Gucci bags and, and so forth. Uh, you know, Disney movies and, and Microsoft uh, computer software. But it's, 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 um, that one, that's one aspect. I mean, on the other hand, um, you know, it's true, it's, you know, the protection certainly in that area is inadequate. Uh, however, I don't think it's necessarily it's a lack of effort on the part of the Chinese government or judicial system. It's just, um, there's so many people doing it, it's very difficult to see. Um, you know, there are probably thousands of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, people trying to make money by, you know, selling, making and selling Gucci bags, uh, shoes, and, and so it's very difficult to, to um, completely eradicate that. Just like in the U.S., uh, you know, a lot of people use, you know, illegal drugs. It's widespread. Is that because the U.S. government is not determined to eradicate that? It's not. It's a social problem. It's very difficult to deal with. I think it's the same situation in China in terms of IP. That's one area. The second area is IP is if your competitors, I'm you know, it's, it's representing this company, their competitors are big companies. They, uh, in order to make an infringing product, they have to have capital investment, they have to have a factory. In those areas, you can be quite effective in enforcing IP because they cannot just close shop and move somewhere else. Like, you know, People duplicate uh, computer software and so forth. So it can be quite effective. And foreign litigants, actually, when they are plaintiffs, they won a huge number of cases, 70% of, sometimes 80% of the cases. So it's quite effective. Uh, just depends on which you're trying to protect. You know, unfortunately for Disney and Microsoft, uh, IP protection in China certainly is inadequate. But for big industrial companies, the client might is a manufacturer of industrial chemicals. And we're litigating a case. I mean, I'm quite comfortable that uh, we'll, if we won this case, I think we're, it's very likely we'll win a patent infringement case. We're, I'm quite comfortable we'll be able to shut, shut down the uh, infringement. So it really depends on you know, the different perspective. And also uh, the kind of products that you, that you sell in China and the kind of business that you so again, here is an area that you need to um, keep open mind as well. And I, I think the Chinese judges, one thing is, you know, the judges that I have, um, you know, litigated before, I have to say, you know, more than 90% of them are very fair. I mean, they, this, uh, the in-house lawyer, U.S. in-house lawyer, very skeptical. Now we are very close to a long case, a two-year litigation, which is very long in China. <laughs> At the end, I just spoke with him not a few days ago, and he said the judges are very fair, um, very knowledgeable, and um, you know he, he he really his perception of the Chinese legal system is very different now than his perception two years ago. So this there are different aspects. We cannot just look at one aspect. But at the same time, um, ignore that aspect. It's kind of mixed bag, like many things. It's, it's a mixed bag. But I, I'm very comfortable that to say that the Chinese government is very committed to enforce IP. Uh, because if nothing else, they realize that it's critical for China and Chinese companies to move out, 
you know, the technology ladder and eventually compete with you know, uh, European, Japanese, and uh, American companies. So I know both of you guys, uh, both of you work primarily with China, um, but are there any other areas that you're familiar with? And um, are there any insights that you can offer for people who want to work in other parts of Asia? So I think it will be very difficult for a U.S. attorney to go to India and practice Indian patent law. India actually has a very, um, it, it's, you know, just like the country of India. It's very rule-based but very chaotic. <laughs> so when you go to India, they have those traffic rules but nobody applies, applies to it. And the same thing is true in terms of when it talks about law. Right? They have very rigid, very rigid, like very specific to their local regulation. Every time we submit a response to office section, it's like this big. <laughs> Usually when we do it in the US, it's like this much. Right? In China, it's like one page. But in India, it's like very formal, very um, very specific. But on the other hand, people, I, I think when it talks about enforcement, IP enforcement in India, it's much less, a much bigger problem in India than in China. Would you agree? Um, I, I think it's a kind of different side of uh, issue. I, 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 I think the, China, the Indian legal system is some a lot more mature than the U.S. legal system in, in terms of enforcement. Uh, but quite often the litigation takes a long time. Even some criminal cases take more than 10 years. <laughs> so it's a lack of uh, capability, and also in the patent office as well, it often it takes a long time to examine the patent application. So that's kind of a different set of issues than uh, what you would face in China. And I, let me just point out, if you're working, interested in working in Asia outside of uh, China, um, you know, it's not Asia, it's not all China. <laughs> um, you know, Japan is a terrific option. The Japanese uh, government just opened the legal market. Um, now, foreign law firms can practice Japanese law. So we just merged with a Japanese uh, patent boutique firm doing litigation in Japan. So a lot of opportunities. I, in fact, I think there are more opportunities in Japan relative to the size than there are in China. And there are many U.S. practitioners in, in uh, working in Japan. Another market is Korea. Uh, we just signed a free trade agreement with Korea. One of the provisions is uh, that requires the Korean government to open up the legal market. So foreign law firms have begun to uh, set up offices in Korea. And I think, uh, I don't know exactly what's, how that's going to turn out, but I suspect uh, foreign law firms will have more freedom in Korea because of the free trade agreement than they have uh, even in China. You know, there are quite a few restrictions on the areas that you can you know, practice in China. So Korea is really a significant opportunity. It's new, new, it's before that, foreign law firms are not allowed to open offices in Korea. So this is really a new area. If you speak Korean, have uh, some uh, another expertise. I think that's a really good area to get into. And there will be a demand for people who are waiting and can practice. Okay, um, that was all the questions I have. So I'd like to open it up to you guys if you have any questions. Um, it sounds like patent probably is the strong part as far as uh, the interaction with China. Or, or could you distinguish a little bit about what your observations are? In either enforcement or transactional with a soft IP as opposed to, um, you know, the, the, the patent um, and where uh, the opportunities might be in soft IP, for example. You mean, are you talking about copyright? Or yeah, copyright, um, um, trademark, and those things. In other words, for those of us who don't have the advanced degrees in hard sciences. I think the law in China in terms of copyright enforcement trademarks is different, very different from patent. Patent is by far the most advanced, and you can count on the, uh, the legal system to enforce. Copyright is a totally different issue. 
Um, and I would welcome someone's comments because you work in the software industry, the electronics, engineering. Um, copyright is much less of an issue for pharmaceuticals. We don't encounter those kind of issues. Well, it's, it's, it, I, I would divide it into, um, in terms of copy patents versus copyright and trademark, and also in, uh, in terms of transactional. And uh, on one hand, and litigation and, and patent prosecution on the other hand. Uh, so for someone who does not have a technical degree, certainly you can work in the trademark area, which is trademark enforcement is a huge issue, just like Disney and, 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 and so forth, and Starbucks. And, uh, copyright is another area that does not require technical degree, but if you try to enforce software uh, copyright, quite often it involves computer systems, the codes, and so forth. That requires some technical degree. But a lot of you know, internet copyright protection does not require technical degree. Transactional work does not require technical degree. Licensing does not require uh, IP due diligence in connection with mergers and acquisitions uh, that does not involve um, the technical degree. Uh, IP is the most important assets for a foreign, for foreign company in China. When they go to China, uh, the only advantage essentially they have, not only patents and copyright trademark, but trade secrets. You know, we've been doing this for 100 years and Chinese companies have been doing that for five years. All this experience is reflected in trade secrets. So that's another area that's very important. A lot of the infringement in China is employees work for American companies, just like my client, leave and set up his own company taking trade secret away. So the, the IP is very important. Quite often, transactions in China involves IP. Uh, that does not require uh, you know, technical background. For instance, you want to invest in China, a joint venture. The only thing that you offer is IP, trade secret patents, and the Chinese side provide um, you know, land, employees, and all the other things, customers, and so on. Now, in the joint venture, how do you value your IP? You know, you say, I want 50% of the company and 20 patents. Is that enough? You have to get approval from the Chinese government and say, that's enough, that's $20 million. You cannot, in China, a lot of, a lot of things, there are regulations. You cannot say, oh, okay, Chinese company say, oh, that's 20 million, your 20 patents is $10 million, and, and that's fine, let's sign the contract. We have to get the approval from the Chinese government. So how to put that package together to get approval from the Chinese government? It requires a lot of maneuver, uh, cooperation uh, uh, accountants, and so forth. So all these things do not require technical degree. So, uh, you know, actually there are more things to do in China, IP, related uh, matters in China that do not require technical expertise than those that, that uh, do require technical expertise. Any other questions? Let me ask a question that builds on that. I, I have students who come to me and they're in, they recognize there's demand in the IP area. Uh, they're interested in IP. Uh, they don't have technical backgrounds, and I think you've just addressed that component. Um, you know, and maybe they've taken a, survey course on intellectual property and one other course. Uh, and the question is, well, is that enough, uh, you know, to put me in play uh, with an with a international, you know, multinational firm that's working on IP issues? What kind of package are you looking for, uh, you know, when you're making your hiring decisions as sort of a, a, a minimum? So that goes back to my earlier comment about two different career paths. If you're taking the career path that you want to be trained in the U.S. and getting really just like forget about the China component, then usually if you want to practice IP like in the patent field, you need a, you need a advanced degree, a technical degree. But if you are more transactional, even if you're just dealing with the patents, as long as you're not dealing with the patent office, you don't have to have a technical degree at all. Um, and there are still a lot of things you can do. But that, that means you would take the, the other career path, which means you would not, not be an expert in like, patent law, but you would be a transactional lawyer who specializes in cross-border transactions. 
So, for example, I, I'm working on a cross-border transaction here, and I'm the only person on my team that has a PhD. And it doesn't really require me to have a PhD just because of the pattern trade. But the issues we face, they're not very pattern focused. It's more like transactional, and the, the IP component only, only comes in when, you, when it comes to evaluate how strong the IP is. And you don't really need a technical degree to assist in that because clients have a lot of technical background, so they can provide you with that as long as you have an open mind, and you can pick up the issues. I don't think that you need a technical degree at all. It's just USPTO requires. It. <laughs> <laughs> to follow up on that, what kind of um, qualities are more attractive? Because you know, the job market, everyone, all the students want to make themselves look more marketable. So what are the most desirable qualities? So I have interviewed almost like a dozen candidates in the past few weeks. I can definitely share that with you. So we're looking for somebody who's passionate, who really wants to be a team builder. And um, you don't have to be necessarily the most knowledgeable person, but you know what you're getting into. Like, for example, in the patent profession, usually what we ask is, do you know what patent attorneys do? And you'll be surprised about the answers you get. <laughs> and people don't do research. So we appreciate people who really research into what they are, want to get into. And they're really passionate about it. And they're open-minded. So they are a team builder. Um, those are the most important um, qualities we're looking for. I, I haven't done any recruiting. Um, for like six years, so I, I don't have recent uh, experience to draw on. But I, I one point that uh, from a uh, professor hand uh, question that I can remind me, uh, both of us from you know, quote unquote big law firms. So, but that's only you know one area. There are um, small, medium law firms. There are you know office positions and. And uh, you know they do very interesting work as well, especially in-house. Um, you know, if you want to work with China, that's a terrific opportunity. All the big companies have a presence in China, so if you have some experience, uh, they'll be ready to send you to China. Uh, Caterpillar, one of our clients, uh, the head of IT is actually a U.S. patent lawyer doesn't speak any Chinese as far as I can tell. <laughs> um, but she's in charge of you know, Caterpillar's IP in China. So, and she's uh, really enjoy working there. But th there are a lot of opportunities. Um, in terms of, um, you know, uh, what kind of candidates, uh, uh, you know, uh, candidates uh, law firms are looking for, uh, I agree with Janet. I think if, if you go in interviewing as a patent attorney, then you have to show some interest in that area and knowledge, and probably some background as well, technical background would be very helpful. But if you're not going, you just say, I just want the IP, I don't have technical background, I just want the IP, I uh, want to be an IP lawyer, um, at least it's my experience that quite often they don't put you in a separate Unfortunately, uh, a lot of our friends look at your you know, GPA and all the other things. And um, unless you have a technical degree and want to be a patent attorney, they, I think they don't say, oh, you are interviewing for IP lawyer. They generally don't look at it that way. They probably put you in, in the same category as everybody else. Um, but if you have some special uh, skills, I would definitely emphasize that. For instance, if you say, oh, I speak Chinese, I'll major in Chinese when I was in uh, college, or I speak Japanese or Koreans. And these are skills that are actually very helpful. And a lot of friends are really And one thing to be careful about is just don't, do over, don't oversell that. Like we have a lot of people coming to us and say, oh, I speak Chinese. I have a lot of connections in China. I can help you build business. And you're looking at that. That's not necessarily what we're looking for. <laughs> so don't oversell it. Um, so I have a question. In terms of the education and career paths of 
uh, young uh, graduates from a U.S. law school. So as I understand it, both of you have familiarity with Chinese law as well, and I think that's necessary. And uh, as I see it, that you both acquired it on the job. Uh, is there an alternative in terms of educational opportunity to go to China and familiarize oneself with Chinese law to some extent, and keeping in mind that some people would be speaking Chinese, but there might be others who would not be speaking Chinese? Um, I don't know if you guys, I know Santa Clara has a great program with Jiangtong University, uh, like exchange program. Mm -hmm. And we have, have uh, I know several Santa Clara students who took Patna uh, course in that university. Mm -hmm. and that's a fantastic opportunity for people to get experience. I don't know if you have a study abroad program at law school. Yeah, yeah let me follow up on that. We do have two programs, one at Shanghai <laughs> Jiao Tong University uh, and one at uh, Beijing University. Uh, and so we send uh, up to six students a year. Uh, some of whom uh, speak Chinese and others who don't. Uh, so there are 